From the Radio Cafe and the Kivira Coalition, you're listening to Down to Earth, the Planet to Plate podcast. I'm your host, Mary Charlotte Domandi. Today we're going to be talking to someone who grew a highly productive food forest on an eighth of an acre of land. That's right after these quick announcements. This program is sponsored by Shine, a pet food company that features over 40 organic, fresh dog and cat food recipes that give your animals delicious and balanced meals. Shine uses responsibly sourced ingredients and earth-friendly packaging, and they're a certified B Corporation, which means that they meet the highest social and environmental standards. My own dogs eat Shine pet food, and they love it, even my very finicky dog, Curly. Shine has stores in Santa Fe, Boulder, and Denver, and you can order online from anywhere at shine.pet. This program is sponsored by the Agrarian Trust. Agrarian Trust is charting a new path forward for the land trust movement. They're advancing an innovative and robust model of land ownership in which agrarianism, social and environmental justice, community well-being, and the earth itself are all seen as fundamentally intertwined. They're doing this by helping regenerative farmers and ranchers to secure long-term affordable leases. That helps to strengthen local food systems and to transform community relationships to the land across the country. Visit agrariantrust.org to learn more. This program is sponsored by the Greenhorns. Listeners to Down to Earth might enjoy the newly released sixth edition of the New Farmer's Almanac, a literary miscellany written by and for working agrarians. This year's volume is titled Adjustments and Accommodations, and it's full of essays, poetry, and images that explore how people are facing challenges and uncertainties on the land. Learn more and order your copy at greenhorns.org. I'm very happy to welcome Roxanne Swensel. She's a native of Santa Clara Pueblo here in northern New Mexico, and she's an internationally renowned artist whose work has won many awards and is in major museums around the world, including the Smithsonian National Museum of the American Indian. She's founder and president of Flowering Tree Permaculture Institute, and we're here today to talk about her work and especially agroforestry. Welcome to Down to Earth. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So... You started flowering tree permaculture when you were a young mother of two kids living on Santa Clara Pueblo and building your own house. Is that right? Yes, I was um, 23 when I started building my house here. My grandmother had uh, given me a little corner of property she had in her name in the tribe here and told me, go ahead and build yourself a house. So I began to um, draw out my house with a stick in the dirt one morning. And every day my kids and me would get up. We were living in a little shack at the time. Um, We would go outside and mix some mud because the house is a solar, passive solar adobe house. And so we would mix mud and lay bricks. And um, day by day, the walls would slowly rise. Uh, We stopped for lunch. We stopped for naps. We, like, did it very slowly. And as we had funding and help, also we moved it along. And about uh, when we were at the roof level, we were starting to put the roof on. Uh, One day, uh, my kids came running into the little shack saying that... um, There was a man living in the trees next door. And my aunt, living next door across the driveway, had a little orchard that my grandfather had planted. And she had hired a young young man by the name of Joel Glansberg, who had been um, going to St. John's College in Santa Fe. And he was pruning the fruit trees. So my kids told me that they had never seen a man in a tree before. (laughs) So I sent them over with some sandwiches for him. Pretty soon, Joel came over to thank us for the sandwiches, and we began to talk and found out that he had just taken a permaculture design course from Bill Mollison, who is one of the founders of permaculture, And he was excited to try out some of the methods of uh, permaculture, but didn't have any land to try it on. 
and he um, was saying, hey, you got this property right here. You're building a house. You want to try some of these ideals here. And uh, the more I heard about these concepts, the more I got excited. And so I said yes. And so what were some of the first things you did? I mean, like, what was the permaculture concept at that time? Like, you know, what did he tell you that you got excited about? Um, he was telling me things like, we could grow a forest of food <laughs> that we could plant all kinds of fruit trees and berries and and have chickens and have all sorts of things that would help feed us right here on this land. If we put them all together in the right way, we could really produce a lot. And you have to realize that I literally was standing in a driveway and this was sandy, hard packed, sun beaten land. And the idea that we could possibly, with these concepts, turn this place into something that was alive and nurturing was quite exciting to me. And I thought, oh, okay, let's try this. Let's try it. And so, I mean, sun-baked, hard-packed land and the idea of putting a forest on it, you know, that's an act of imagination. <laughs> Yeah, we were young, <laughs> we're bold and fearless <laughs> and had nothing to lose because we were both pretty, you know, we were both homeless, really. I was living in a shack and he was living out of his car and we thought, well, let's put a roof on this house and start planting things. And so what were the first things you did? We were very caught up with the ideals through permaculture around pattern understanding. I was most caught by that, maybe because it rang true to my Pueblo indigenous background of symbols and patterns being a very uh, important part. And I was caught by, you know, we first stand on the land and you watch the patterns around you, meaning where does the sun rise? Where does it set? Where does the wind blow? What direction does it come from? Which way does, you know, the birds come? Everything you can notice on a piece of property is the pattern understanding that's going to help give you the direction. And so given that we were standing out in a driveway, <laughs> sun-baked, hard ground, um, the first thing we wanted was shelter. And of course we had been, I had been building this house. So we had a north side of a house, a south side of a house, a west side of a house, and an east side of a house to work with. So that could be used. But we also, you know, had a little bit of land around it, but it was very barren. I mean, all there was was some ants. The ants didn't mind the sand. Um, and we realized we needed to bring in protection. So the first thing we did was we went and got a rock. <laughs> and I always talk about, you know, when you need shelter and you don't have anything, a rock is pretty good. <laughs> so we actually, it was... How big was the rock? Yes, I was going to say. It was, it was a fairly big rock. We had to um, lift it together. So it was big enough that it took two people to lift it. We thought it was such a cool rock and we felt so so rich having a rock <laughs> and we went and placed it in in the yard and we knew that this rock would do several things it would create a microclimate around it it would have a sunny side it would have a, a wetter side cooler side it would block the wind coming from one direction on the other side, it would also act as a water catchment. So if the rain, if it rained, the rain would um, hit the rock and the water would slide off the rock and run down below it. And once the water was seeped around the rock, it would act as like a mulch. It would keep the water, the moisture from evaporating. So just placing a rock created a whole world that we could start with. So we went and we planted a plant on the north side of this rock. And that was our beginning. 
What did the rock actually do? Like the idea of the different sides of the rock, the sunny side, the the cooler and wetter side, what actually happened when you placed it? Um, Because we knew that, you know, as a living being ourselves, that we like shelter, we like nutrients, (laughs) we like... We like to be cared for. The rock actually was being like a mother to this little area of life. So once we planted, we chose, you know, you you realize the the tree needed as much moisture as it could get because we live in the high desert. It needed the warmth of the rock, you know, soaking in the sun in the daytime and radiating it out at night for nighttime cool temperatures and winter temperatures and it also acted like just a windbreak and so we knew to plant the tree on the north side of this rock kind of you know towards the the east side of it just because our westerly winds would um, not hit it and dry it out as fast so it acts as a mother it acts as a, a little nursery for Uh, life to begin. And sure enough, you know, the tree um, did well. It, uh, it grew. And as it grew, you know, the birds started to come and sit on it. And birds do what birds do. And they would poop and fertilize that area. And then come winter, the leaves drop and hey, you got more mulch and that mulch is going to like decompose and start building soil. And little by little, you start creating life again out of nothing. How did you choose what kind of tree you were going to plant and what was the tree? That particular tree was a pinyon tree just because it was, we knew it was a hardy local tree. Um, But we did as we ventured to put more of these rocks around the yard and make more little nucleus of life happening, we were trying to find plant species that would do good in this climate and would also maybe give back in in good ways. Uh, We did choose black locusts because they're a nitrogen fixer and they would um, help produce some nitrogen for other plants around them. They also are hardy wood, so if we did need to cut it down, it, it was a really useful product of wood, wood product, and and the animals like to eat it. We also brought in um, Siberian pea shrub. I had never heard of that before, but it was very hardy to this climate because the climate here was very similar to Siberia, and and it would. It would act the same way. It was a nitrogen fixer, and it would produce a little pod that would hopefully feed animals, birds, and stuff. And so those we were trying to find hardy plants to start. There's an interesting question about native and non-native species and how you choose like a species from Siberia that some people might consider quote-unquote invasive or non-native but not invasive. How do you think about that? Uh, I, at that time with, that we were planting, we were just trying to find anything that would grow. Uh, I mean, I, I didn't know very many species of plants at that time. But as I've, you know, studied <laughs> the forest and different plants for, for the last 30 years, what I have come to understand is, you know, our local plants that have evolved in this climate are perfect for this environment. They have adapted to the the seasons, the low water, the cold and the hot. They, they're very good for this climate. But they're also sometimes not the best for producing a lot of fruit, for instance. So to pick other species to implement in your food forest, is is an interesting thing. It's like, well, do I bring this species in? Will it be an invasive thing or will it add to it? And I like to think that any species can be invasive if it acts 
like a colonizer. And for instance, I, I laugh and I go, you know, Chinese elms are a perfect example of a colonizer. It grows really well here. So in, in some ways, it's a really good tree for here. But it pushes other plants out and it, and it grows as fast as it can to push out other plants. That to me is a colonizer plant. So I, you know, I tend to think not well of it because it's like, hey, wait a minute. We're all trying to get along here. You know, if, if you're, if I plant an apricot tree, which is also a foreign tree, it doesn't push all the other plants out. It grows into an apricot tree and sometimes it will produce fruit. Sometimes it won't, but it's not taking over the whole landscape. Cheatgrass is another colonizer plant that that makes me upset because I'm trying to plant, you know, this native grasses that take more time and they get their roots way down and they have to do a lot more to get established. And here comes the cheatgrass and it'll come in really fast and take over an area and and um the the animals don't want to eat it because it 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 runs its course too fast and becomes brittle and dry. And um and it just it acts like a invasive force that doesn't take into consideration anything else around it. <laughs> so that's how I think about the plants. I mean it's and the you can't help but think about the analogy to human societies. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Just how people behave yeah. when they either come in. Because we don't in, have to act yeah. like a colonizer. You know, it's like, how do you come into a system and add to it without taking over it or without consuming it all? How do you be a positive effect on the place instead of a negative effect? And that, I mean, that whole way of thinking you know, when you go back to this, I mean, it's an eighth of an acre. It's what most people consider a very tiny amount of land. And you've got literally over, I think over a hundred different species of plants growing here. And the way of that way that you have taken of what you call listening to the land, like asking the land what it wants, and then listening for the answer. What is, how do you do that? (laughs) By being present with it, by being part of it, and and not assuming you know everything, um, being open to seeing, to hearing, to feeling what the place needs, and and we make mistakes too. And there's many times I planted, you know, I gave it my best um, decision to plant something somewhere, and realized it was the wrong place for it to be, and I learned. <laughs> but and I'm con- constantly learning. Yes, it's a very small place, but it's rich. It's so rich and it's just getting richer every year. So living with it, watching it grow from nothing to this little small forest has been such a gift. I've learned so much. I've learned so much. Did you think about this as a process of restoration? a process of creating something that had never been before? I mean, restoration, you think about putting things back the way they were, but maybe this is something that is the way it never was, like a a new thing. I think of it more as a love story because I didn't know enough about, you know, the ideals of restoration at the time. I just like seeing things grow. And then when that plant grew and made more leaves and made a fruit or some other plant came over and and then other things happened because they were next to each other and the birds came and more animals came in and I saw the soil start building up. It's it, it's so exciting. It and I I love it. I love watching the birds. I love watching the plants. I love watching it evolve. So to me, it's like just being in love with life and seeing where it needs help and trying to help it out and seeing where um, I messed up and trying to, you know, redo something. And 
but mostly stepping back and watching and and loving it. So it's it's a love story. You're listening to Down to Earth. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. We're in a new chapter of conservation. In the first chapter of conservation in this country, you had wilderness and then you had city. But today, more and more, we understand that there's this very important piece in the middle that we call the working landscape. That is Leslie Allison, the executive director of the Western Landowners Alliance. These are the places that provide our food, our fiber. They provide the jobs that sustain the rural communities. These things are incredibly important and they're disappearing. And that's really our next challenge going forward. We have to think beyond protected wilderness. And you can't do that unless you're engaging the people in those landscapes, first and foremost, in that solution. Led by the people on the ground, Western Landowners Alliance advances policies and practices that sustain working lands, connected landscapes, and native species. What we're seeing in the West today is incredibly hopeful because you do see collaborations, working with partners, trying to realize this vision that's so important to us. I think many places in the rural West are actually leading the way on this. And so can you. Join us and learn more at westernlandowners.org. And now back to our program. You ended up really using and living from a lot of what you grew here, like firewood and food and so on. Talk about that. Mm-hmm. So as as we planted all the things we could think to plant, we were also, you know, working with a slight slope to the to the eighth of an acre piece of land, and so we were making some uh, swales and some terraces and just adding little structures here and there to the land to help hold nutrients and water and anything else. Meantime, planting more things, and as you know, some things grew. They made shade for other things to come in. For instance, once once a canopy happened, then you'd, you'd start to be able to grow things like all the bulbs and stuff underneath the canopy began to thrive because there was more shade and, and a soil in the landscape. But as each plant was planted we were going is this good for us to eat is this good for the chickens or the sheep or the what is it good for and we're always asking well what do you do plant you know the different plants have different traits to them just like people and it's like well do you do good in this system and do you help do you help do you make it a better place (laughs) um we began to to get a richer and richer environment here. And within, I would say, about six years, we had a pretty fruitful little garden oasis happening here. And it fed and housed and took care of a family of four for a while. We got a lot of firewood out of it so that, you know, some of the, especially the black locusts that had grown tall and were no longer uh, needed in that spot, we would harvest and that would be our firewood. We would get all these fruiting trees from apricots and peaches and cherries and grapes and um, apples and pears and Oh my gosh, we had we've had lots of plants come through. And now through, you know, it's been 36 years as I count it this morning, and um the succession has changed over so so some of the plants have come and gone years ago. It's like like traveling through uh, a family timeline and some of the the relatives have have lived their life out and and new ones have come in, and you realize that as the land changes here, it is asking for different plants, asking for different needs. Um, we no longer could plant our vegetable garden near the house because it was too shady, <laughs> so it got moved further away. Because all the trees that had grown up. Yes, yes. And the house changed because the house, you know, sat in this forest and as it 
grew up around the forest, the house became engulfed in this little mini forest and changed as well. One of the things you grew and that I'm looking at right now as we sit here in your house is bamboo, which you think of as the most non-native sort of <laughs> tropical, you know, rainful, rainy season kind of plant. And yet it's lush and growing. It's been here for 20 years. How did you think to start with bamboo? My memory of the bamboo was that Joel was like trying to find all the species that might grow in this high desert. And he found a species of um, bamboo that grew about the size of a small pinky with very small bamboo that was known to be able to handle cold weather because we get cold here. So he got some cuttings of it and we put it right near the bathroom drain that spilled out into a swell in the courtyard. And we thought, well, we'll try it there because it liked water. So we thought we can drink the bathtub water. And it made a few more sprouts, and and that's about it. For about you know 10 years, it just kind of did that. And then in about 15 years, it kind of spread maybe a foot more here and there, a little sprout. And then it hit 20 years. And at the 20-year mark, all of a sudden, these giant shoots started coming up all over the courtyard of bamboo that would go about 20, 30 feet high. And we're like, whoa, what happened to the bamboo? And realized that, you know, I've known that it takes 20 generations for any species to adapt to a location. And I realized it had been 20 years and this bamboo had finally figured out this place (laughs) and took off. And so, um, It has not become an invasive species, but it certainly is making amazing shoots of bamboo, which we cut and use for shade, fencing. Uh, Somebody was saying they they were using some for for a mat. Um, It's very useful stuff. And, And the cool thing is it's an evergreen. So in the winter time, I get snow on these beautiful green bamboos in the courtyard. And it's, I mean, it's adapted and working because of the bath water. Mm -hmm. And the, and the rainwater coming off the roof of the house too. So what are the points of contact between the permaculture idea and the indigenous ideas of agriculture that you grew up with and that are, you know, native to this place and go back thousands of years. Mm. How I would put the permaculture design methods together with my ancestral people's knowledge of living on the land mostly would have to do with how do you live in an environment in a way that is in balance with it, where you do not deplete it of all its new of of its resources, where you can live in a way that it takes care of you and you also do your part of it. It's a reciprocal kind of exchange so that, you know, if you if you're picking a lot of say, um, I always think of, uh, you know, going up the canyon here and looking for mushrooms or looking for the wild asparagus or something. And, uh, and you, you don't want to pick all of them. You want to, to make sure some of them mature into seed so that more will grow next year. You want to make sure that you encourage them not take it all. And, and then you know, you lose out because there won't be any next year. Um, The same goes with every aspect of it. It's like, if you like that plant, if it benefits you in ways, then you take care of it. You make sure that you don't harm it. You know, we go pinion picking, but you take care of those pinions then. We go get the wild parsley in the hills. It's like, you don't take them all. You, You take only so much. You make sure that they stay strong. That is a very permaculture concept. And in my little forest here, 
that's the same thing. It's like you, you pay attention, you make sure that you nurture it and, and let it um, help you back. So how did the Flowering Tree Permaculture Institute come into being? I mean, the original concept was, let's try to plant something and let's put a rock. Uh, (laughs) But then it evolved into something where you were really sharing it with a wider group Mm -hmm. of people. Mm -hmm. Yes. So so after we learned from the rock, (laughs) and we like put more rocks and learned from them some more, and we were very excited. We were learning about all kinds of aspects of how do you get plants and life to grow in this environment. Um, We realized that we had learned some really special things that we wanted to share. And, um, and Joel, again, was still in the picture. And he says, let's, let's, let's create a nonprofit so that we can also gather resources in that way in order to keep this going, to, to get the momentum going. Let's really, let's really do this. And um, so we started to work on creating the nonprofit. And we were having small classes here at the house at the time. And the classes were all the way from um, planting things and, co- you know, which plants do well together, how to understand microclimates, how to watch the patterns of the world around you, animal husbandry making pottery, you know, food production, how to milk your sheep, <laughs> you know, it, anything that has to do with living on a piece of property, uh, how, how do you do that? And a lot of people were interested. It's like, well, how do you butcher a chicken? You know, people may think that's a cool idea, but they've never seen it done or done it themselves. And we could do that. We could show them. Um, and how do you then put it back so that the plants grow better? And how do you plant what so that you can feed your sheep? Now, you had chickens and sheep in your food forest basically the whole time? Yes, we had animals pretty early on. Uh, we got chickens and turkeys and ducks and fish and pigs and a donkey at one point. All on this tiny, <laughs> tiny little... Yes, it's been... Uh, Quite a quite a zoo at times, <laughs> but we used all the animals to help because one of the the best things we did early on was we created a chicken tractor, and the chicken tractor is basically a movable cage that you can like instead of putting a chicken in a chicken coop, you put them in this movable cage so that wherever they are that day or that week is a new piece of ground. They'll scratch it up, they'll eat all the weeds, they'll poop all over it, fertilizing it, aerating it, all the good things you need, all just because they're chickens. And then you move them and they'd be a chicken in a new spot and fix that piece of land, helping it to get fertilized and grow better. So we did that with turkeys, we did that with chickens, we did that with rabbits, we did that with a pig, um, and it all helped the, the soil build up. How did your children respond to all of this? Were they into it? Mm, both my uh, children grew up in the time we were building all this, and and they were actually homeschooled. Uh, my son was homeschooled for seven years of this, and so he was very aware of how it all worked. He was part of learning how to survive on a piece of land, but we would do it all in an educational form. So I remember one day teaching them fractions by building our kitchen cabinets and they had to do the measurements with the measuring tape. It's like, okay, go cut me, go mark a piece of wood at 17 inches and three quarters. And and they'd have to figure that out. Or we'd have to chop some wood and I'd say, okay, here's a piece of wood now chop it in half, <laughs> now chop it in a quarter, now chop it in a, in an eighth, you know, and on and on. They were learning by doing, which I think was a wonderful way to get educated. Would you say that you were, I mean, I don't, this is such a weird word, but were you self-sufficient food-wise during, during those years when they were small? 
I remember, you know, trying to make that a goal. We were trying to see if a family of four could live on an eighth of an acre piece of property. And we were trying our best to see if we could do that. And interestingly, there were some things that, that were like, wow, we can't produce da, 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 da. Um, One of the things was salt. Salt was right. a big deal. And I, we went, we still have to go to the store for salt. We still have to go to f- the store for... Um, one of the things we realized was that the we had sheep at the time. The sheep, even though they were a bigger animal than a chicken, they were easier to to feed on this property than a chicken because they ate the forage of the leaves. They We could just throw weeds to them and stuff, but the birds needed grain and we couldn't quite create enough grain for them. So that was, you know, interesting little things that you don't realize. Were you milking the sheep? We were milking the sheep at one point and we could make cheese out of it. Amazing. So what is the Institute doing now? I mean, you've got projects pretty far afield in New Mexico, not just right here on your home base. (laughs) Yeah, flowering tree has kept growing. (laughs) The forest has grown. We acquired several other properties that since we, you know, implemented this place, we wanted to do more, you know, try other, other spots other conditions because every piece of land is different is unique and so it's kind of like this challenge of like okay how about this piece how can you turn this into the most richest place it could be what are the factors we have to work with so one of the one of the properties we have is across the river and we've been doing a lot of classes over there uh, all kinds of classes but it's a farm site because we have, it's two acres and it feels so huge next to working with an eighth of an acre to have two acres just seems endless. I think it'll take the rest of my life to fill that up with, with all that it could be <laughs> and, and more. Um, but we have a greenhouse now. We have a field that we grow out different crops in. We have classroom spaces, big areas to work with bigger groups and um, process the food that comes in, teach different aspects of our life, whether it's, you know, how to make a basket to how to spin some cotton. And that gets into the cultural preservation piece of this Mm -hmm. work. Yes, I'm from Santa Clara Pueblo, and as a native person uh, from this village, I've always been very concerned with our cultural survival of who we are as Pueblo people, and whether it's the language or all our different traditions and our foods, all the different things that make us who we are here at Santa Clara has really been important. And so, you know, that's a big aspect right now of Flowering Tree is cultural revitalization by way of the foods, the the crafts, uh, language, building, uh, thinking, <laughs> prayers, songs, you name it. It's very much part because I realized that for me as a Native person here, permaculture ends up being... Uh, who we have been all along. And so it's just putting it back. We've lost a lot of the pieces being a colonized people and and losing some uh, some aspects of our connection to place because of all of the money economy and everything that has happened. But it's not too late. We can put this back. And for me, the, the big push is that we all can do this. The land wants to come back and we can help it no matter who we are, where we're from. We can stop and listen and notice and see what it's telling us it needs and put it back. We can move a rock. <laughs> are your 
friends and neighbors and relatives here on Santa Clara Pueblo taking to that? You know, are you are you like showing the way? I'm sure you're not the only one, but is that do you feel like there is a kind of cultural revitalization happening here? I do. I do think so. I think and especially I think the the next generation that's coming into their adulthood are really conscious of uh that if we don't do something we will we will go extinct we will not exist anymore as a as a people here as a distinct unique beautiful people so there is a push for keeping um, the language and more awareness around the foods more awareness around just preserving ourselves <laughs> Talk about seed saving, because that's a big piece of, of the whole thing. I've been uh, saving seeds ever since we've moved that first rock. We've been saving seeds. I became aware that, you know, our people here had our own crops and that uh, those crops are very adapted to this climate. They were they were drought tolerant. They were um, short seasoned. They are very adapted to here. But then not only in those ways, but they were culturally connected to us. You know, those, those corn species were our, you know, we considered them our mothers. We considered them relatives. Uh, so, so on that aspect, it's like, why are we not taking care of them? You know, why are we shopping at Walmart? Why are we like buying our, our corn from Iowa, you know, we don't have relations to that, that our corn mothers are here, we still have seed of them. So we need to be growing them out. So 30 some years ago, I was um, started a seed bank. And I've now have three little seed banks going. And they're filled with, um, you know, traditional seeds of our ancestors of the Pueblo people or the native peoples of the Southwest. And, you know, when you start talking about the idea of the corn mother, and when I was here last, you were talking about singing to the corn and the corn hearing the songs. I mean, that's when you really start to depart from the, you know, Western European scientific worldview. I mean, there's something else going on that's very deep mm -hmm. and that's maybe hard for outsiders to understand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I think the one thing that the indigenous peoples of this continent can help relay to all people that have come from other places is that there is a sense of home that is missing when you have been moved um, too much. And anyone who has, you know, stayed in a location for a while knows things about that place, and the place knows them. There becomes a very deep sense of friendship, connection, um, of knowing. Um, and that knowing, imagine if for generations that knowing remained to the point that place-based is a different thing. And the closest thing I can like describe that, I was thinking, how do you tell somebody who doesn't know home how home feels? And they can say, oh, yeah, I really, you know, I love this place. It feels really good. And it's like, no, no, no. You don't know what home feels until you've been there for many generations. <laughs> and then I thought, well, how, what's the closest thing you could go? It's like, well, I guess when you have a child <laughs> or maybe the other direction, your, your mom and dad, it's like, you may not like them or you may not get along with them all that well but you're connected to them deeply <laughs> and there's there's um a sense of home there even if you may struggle with it there's home you can't get away from it even if you go all the way across the world 
you're still, you still have your daddy's nose. <laughs> you still have your smile, your, the smile your mom has. You still do those little awkward movements that, you know, <laughs> they have. It's like, you know, the connection is really there. And what if that extended into the landscape where the land and you are so one because it's you've grown up together and your your great 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 grandma grew up with them and they're telling the same stories and they're and they're sitting on that rock that rock will hold your children and it just goes on and on and there's a feeling of the depth of belonging or being part of something whether you like it or not, it's not about, you know, people think, oh, it's home because I like it. It's like, no, no, no. This is a different kind of belonging. This is, you you just belong. It's in your bones. Um, and I think we all need to, to start doing that, to start traveling that road of belonging again, because how do you know what something needs if you don't know its language, if you can't hear what it's trying to tell you? And that takes spending time in a place to go, oh, it's very sad today. This hill is very sad today. Why is it sad? It's not just a hill. You've lived here so long, you know what it feels it's a deeper connection. And, and I think all of us on this planet, we're all in a state right now where if we don't do something, we're all going down. And I think the earth is screaming to be heard. And we're too busy jumping around going, oh, well, I like it over here better, but nobody's listening. <laughs> it's like, well, what about the earth? Where, what does it, what does it need? What do the plants need? What do the animals need? We're not the only ones here. I often think about, you know, the the causes of climate change and so many people whom I know say, oh, they, they usually were, you know, they have the concept of the bucket list and all the things they want to do before they die. And a lot of them have to do with travel. Mm. And I think, I mean, for me personally, for me, it has to do with staying home more, you know, and, and deepening my relationships that I already have rather than going out to new places and somehow, I don't know, it, it feels, sometimes it feels almost consumerist. It's like, oh, I'm going to yeah, go consume more things. Iceland. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Or, or that place is still pretty. Let's go be there. Yeah. Instead of like, how about let's leave that alone then if it's, yeah. if it's Or not. at the very least, you know, if, if like maybe somebody who's in their twenties and who has a great desire to travel, they should go do that, you know, mm. but when you're a little older, maybe you don't need to do that as mm. much. And it's more important to deepen the relationships with people in place that you already have. Yeah. And, and I also think it's a difference between jumping outside yourself versus going within yourself and, and traveling over there, over there, you know, the grass is always greener over somewhere else, but it's, it's a, actually a kind of jumping outside of yourself. There's a different thing that happens when you sit within yourself and you know go sit in your own backyard and if you don't like it fix it then make it so you do like it you want to go to some you know national park make your backyard a national park you know make it so beautiful you don't need to go to a national park it's it's as beautiful as anywhere you know you could do that um it's a healing within instead of jumping outside. And that circles back to the whole concept of how do we grow food mm. and how do we mm. nourish ourselves and nourish our neighbors. And, you know, the, the phrase feed the world comes up a lot, yeah. but sometimes I think it's more about, I don't know. I mean, we, 
you know, you got to feed people in cities and they, they don't have even the eighth of an acre sometimes if, mm-hmm. even if they had the time to do that and feed themselves. But mm. it is, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I guess I wonder how you think about that in terms of looking at the kind of big picture. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I worry about those people in the cities, but there are spots, you know, it doesn't, what I learned is that you could do a whole lot in a little spot. You know, a windowsill can be rich. Um, a tiny backyard can be exquisite. Um, and you don't, it doesn't have to be, like maybe you don't have the land to grow the food in, but you can do another aspect of it. You can maybe carry the food from here to there or share, help help pass it around from where it is growing. Um, you could maybe be the cook You could be the one that cooks it really well and gets it out to people in a healthy way. Um, You could, there's, there's more parts that can be beneficial and, uh, but be creative. We got to be creative again. And, and instead of also, I, I think we, we got, I don't want to use the word lazy, but it is kind of like there's a laziness that happened when we thought that somebody else will do it for us. And um, um, I think we're realizing that we gave away our power when we did that. Um, corporations have taken over, and now we sit here going, I wonder if the big trucks are going to bring toilet paper you know it's like uh uh-oh if we're if we've gotten that dependent on big corporations and uh, pharmaceuticals and all of the big industry um we're really in a weak position but the more things we do for ourselves the more we're taking back our power more self-empowerment we're giving if we you know so so something that we wear that's one little piece that we took back Uh, if we grew a tomato and ate that tomato that's one little piece we took back Um, we can if if all of us started taking little pieces back those big industries will fall because we're the ones holding them up and also when you start doing those things it changes your your attitude it changes how you see yourself absolutely absolutely and and the more you know you you do something you go wow I did that it feels good it's like you know you grow your own apricot tree and you get your first apricot you're like jumping around going whoa this is the best apricot I ever tasted and it's like (laughs) it's wonderful so you know over and over again growing your own food and you know you bring your first zucchini in it's like this this the ceremony to the table, you know, it, you're, you're valuing things different. You go to, you know, Walmart and get vegetables. It's just vegetables with a price tag on it. They have no story. You don't know where they sat in the sun. You don't know, you know, the little caterpillars. You don't know all the things that made that be there. You just see a vegetable with a price tag. It's so empty. But you start to do it yourself, it makes life so much richer. You are an artist and a very successful and distinguished artist with your work all over the country and all over the world. Is there a relationship that you feel like is going on between your yourself as an artist and yourself as a a grower of the food forest that you're living in? <laughs> People ask me that a lot. How does your art fit in with this permaculture thing? And on one hand, it's kind of like, well, I like making art. <laughs> or, But I also want to say I didn't start making art ever. I My so-called art was created because I couldn't speak as a child. And so I started making clay figurines to speak for me. So they were really my first language. And I still kind of use them as a a kind of language. It's like I'm trying to reach people through them. And how that fits in with permaculture is that 
Um, when I'm talking about being connected, connected to place, uh, I also think we are lacking in connection with each other as human beings. And with my sculpting, I'm able to connect to people around the world in a common language, and that language is the language of emotion. And so it's another connecting piece. And so I think what I'm doing is I'm trying to connect, connect to those birds, connect to those trees, connect to that worm and dirt and connect to those people and those people and, and that person. And, <laughs> you know, it's, it's a connecting process because the more connections we make, um, the stronger our basket is. The reason I wanted to ask you that question was, um, when I first started doing radio 20 years ago, one of the first people I interviewed was a Native American potter who made these beautiful coil pots. Mm -hmm. And I was asking about his process, and he said, well, you've got to listen to the clay. Mm -hmm. And that was the first time I'd ever heard anybody really say that. And it yes. just sounds so much like listening to the land. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And whether you're making something out of clay or leather or yucca or paint it's like that material that you're using if you don't connect to it if you don't pay attention to how it is working you're being a colonizer <laughs> yeah. you gotta stop and listen yeah yeah well i want to thank you for all of your time talking to us today here on Down to Earth. Roxanne Swensel is an artist and the founder of the Flowering Tree Permaculture Institute, which is on the web at floweringtreepermaculture.org. Thanks for being with us. Thank you, Mary Charlotte. Save the date for Regenerate 2023. This conference will be held in Santa Fe, New Mexico, November 1st through 3rd, Regenerate 2023 will explore regenerative agriculture at every scale, from microbial soil communities to social relationships and markets to our changing climate and everything in between. Come learn how people from all walks of life are innovating on the land, in the markets, and with their communities to bring greater diversity and resilience to this movement. Registration will open in June. Check out the website for more information at regenerateconference.com. You've been listening to Down to Earth. We would love it if you would support this program, which you can do by going to patreon.com slash down to earth planet to plate, where you can sign up for as little as $3. Patreon is P-A-T-R-E-O-N. And also please rate and review the podcast on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. The Kivira Coalition is a not-for-profit and a community network of ranchers, farmers, conservationists, scientists, educators, and many others dedicated to regenerative practices that produce healthy food, support meaningful livelihoods, sustain biodiversity, and remedy the impacts of climate change. To learn more about Kivira and how you can support their work, visit kiviracoalition.org, Q-U-I-V-I-R-A. And finally, this show is a production with the Radio Cafe. You can check out radiocafe.org to hear back episodes of this show and also find all kinds of other shows on a wide variety of topics as well. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.